Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on the UN ODC Crime Congress entitled the Kyoto Declaration, Next Steps for Civil Society and Faith-Based Organizations. In this webinar, we will follow up on the recent Kyoto Crime Congress of the UNODC, which took place on March 7th through 12th, 2021 in Kyoto, Japan. And this webinar will give attention to the Kyoto Declaration that was the outcome document of the Congress. And we will focus particularly on next steps that can be taken by faith-based organizations and civil society in general to effectively move forward to reduce crime, prevent violence, contribute to the sustainable development goals, particularly SDG 16, promoting safe and inclusive and just societies, promoting rule of law and reforming systems of criminal justice. I'm happy to serve as co-chair of the Coalition of Faith-Based Organizations. My name is Thomas Walsh, and my fellow co-chair is Dr. Michael Plotzer. And Michael, uh, I turn it to you to say a few words about uh, the Kyoto session that we had, and perhaps uh, introduce the video from that session. Thank you, Tom. Um, yes, excellencies, colleagues, friends, uh, for those who were unable to listen to the auxiliary event that we held in Kyoto, we have arranged this, uh, this uh, session. Um, we had originally intended to rebroadcast the entire meeting. However, after receiving the tapes only this last week, we decided to uh, shorten it and have a very a five minute version of what happened at the, at the, uh, at the Congress. Um, we are, have also mixed feelings about some of the, the way it was organized and the participation of civil society. But I think Ian Tennant will, uh, will refer to that directly. What I wanted to do very, very quickly is to introduce our speakers uh, for that ancillary events. Some of them are already present here. One of them is Jean-Luc Le Mailleux, who's an old friend and has been with us since the beginning in 2019. Um, Ambassador Coker, um, who is from Pakistan, is a newer backer, but uh, he's been with us since last fall and uh, participated in some webinars. Um, the uh, Ambassador Albacete from Kaisit also a founding member of the faith-based organizations uh, will, will participate. Um, uh, Sister uh, Agaswati, a Hindu uh, spiritual leader uh, who has also participated in, in our webinar series last year uh, will participate. And the Lutheran Bishop Yunan, an old stalwart, my inspiration who believes in speaking truth to power. So rather than playing the whole 90 minutes, we will now play five minutes of the highlights. Now you might perhaps uh, know, or perhaps not, but uh, Kyoto is uh, not only the uh, host of the Crime Congress, um, it is as well uh, the religious center of uh, Japan in many ways. I mean, Kyoto tells less than 1,530 Buddhist temples and an added 240 Shinto shrines. Uh, so uh, hopefully, uh, if that doesn't stimulate our discussions here today, then I'm not sure what will. Thank you. 
in a world where more than 80% of the population identifies itself as religious, the potential of religious leaders and faith-based organizations to play a constructive role remains great and often not utilized enough. And I look forward uh, today to hearing from policymakers and religious actors about their experience from the field. I firmly believe that meetings like the one today can help us increase knowledge about the great work being done by FBOs about around the world and identify possibilities of working together for a common cause toward just and peaceful society. We identified two problems to aspects in the discussion of criminal law today. One is the problem of the idolatry of market. Uh, the fragile, vulnerable person is uh, defenseless before the interest of a defied market, which become the only rule. It's what Pope Francis said in Evangelii Gaudium and Laudato Si Encyclica. And the truth is that today some economic sectors exercise more power than the states themselves. This is a reality that is even more evident in times of globalization of a speculative capital. We know that crime and crime prevention and justice are core aspects of any society of any civilization. They permeate not only our courts, not only our police stations, but they permeate really every thread of the tapestry of our societies. We tend to think of them as taking place just in government buildings or police buildings or judicial buildings, but actually they permeate and pervade truly the entire tapestry of our of our civilization of our society faith and religion are powerful and the most effective tools for fostering social solidarity including through the crime prevention that our societies need to rediscover and learn to value in human history faith and religion has often provided the glue that made possible the establishment and preservation of human communities possible. So much so that some sociologists have gone so far as to assert that religion is not so much the worship of God as the worship of society itself. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. once said, the church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. If the church does not recapture its prophetical zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. This statement also applies to faith-based organizations. Faith-based organizations working together for the good for the common good have considerable spiritual power to be the conscience of the member states and UN structures. FBOs must dare to speak truth to power and provide moral guidance. It's the role of the faith-based organization to advance the importance of upholding universal values and especially the value of justice. In our ruthless world, Politics is built on mutual interests, and the FBO's role is to remind politics and politicians that the value of justice will not only secure a shared security, but our shared well-being. Okay, we, we would like to thank all of our 85 presenters during the webinars. We've had outstanding contributions and I personally am a bit saddened that we didn't get a specific mention in the Kyoto Declaration. Three words would have been enough faith-based organizations right alongside academia. 
but now it, turn it over to you, Tom. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so we are going to uh, now move into our very distinguished group of panelists, and I'm very happy you saw him briefly on the video. And this is uh, Mr. Jean-Luc uh, Le Meilleur. He's the director of the Division for Policy Analysis and Public Affairs at the UNODC. He regional representative for Afghanistan and neighboring countries from 2011 to 13 and served as the chief section of Asia and Europe from 2006 to 08. Uh, please welcome Mr. Jean-Luc Le Meilleur. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, it's my pleasure. Excellencies, distinguished guests, many friends who I recognize during and over the webinars which we all have enjoyed together. It's my pleasure to be with uh, you here today and to be able to uh, share with you my thoughts um, on this event organized by the Coalition for Faith-Based Organizations. As well, my congratulations with this uh, um, succinct video. I mean, I think you did very well in capturing some of the highlights of uh, that 90 minutes exchange of views we benefited from uh, during the uh, Kyoto um, Crime Congress. Um, I think, I mean, I hope that you can share that video with all of us uh, later on because um, it, it brings back, I mean, some, uh, some good memories and some great essence of, of the discussion. So congratulations to you, the organizers, for doing that. Many thanks for your kind invite, and, and I uh, am having the pleasure and the honor to see that His Excellency Ambassador Takeshi Hikahara is as well present and therefore I would remain amiss uh, not to express again our common gratitude to the government of Japan for so elegantly and efficiently hosting the 14th UN Crime Congress in Kyoto. As you already uh, showed in my uh, earlier presentation in Kyoto itself, I then referred to Kyoto, beautiful Kyoto, as uh, the spiritual center in Japan and how well fitting the location was I mean, for the faith-based coalition to have a webinar within the opportunity of the Crime Congress hosted in Kyoto itself. Now allow me um, to initiate and to um, uh, start my presentation by pointing out that my statements made here today are part of a process of engagement with civil society that will find a highlight on May the 18th, when we will have a side event during the upcoming Crime Commission, the CCPCJ, organized by the Alliance of NGOs on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice, UNODC's uh, main counterpart. I'm just delighted to see that also Anna Alvazi de Frate, the chair of the Alliance, is seated with us here today at the panel. Indeed, I mean, the Kyoto 14th UN Crime Congress has empowered the Crime Commission with a strong basis to allow follow-up of a wide range of themes noted down in its declaration. I will come back to that later at the end. Now, each of those themes will warrant an in-depth discussion involving member states and evidently also the civil society. Now, this faith-based organization event is as a welcome starting point of a longer process stretching over a period of time. And to navigate this process, as we have been informed, uh, the Umbrella NGO Alliance will introduce next to the webinar we're benefiting here from today, a series of webinars to further expand and take action on selected thematic areas, such as transnational organized crime, gender-based policies, urban safety, and so many others, no doubt, Anna will tell us more about this on this later on in her presentation. Allow me to give you a, a few facts and figures indicating the success of the Kyoto Congress despite the pandemic and the multiple restrictions coming out of the pandemic, which made physical presence extremely challenging. On the positive side, I mean, for the first time within the United Nations, we had the widest technological platform deployed and did that with success. The overall registration for the Congress, 5,680 participants, of which some 400 were from NGOs or attending as individual experts. 
283 NGO representatives from 108 organizations registered for the Congress, and some additional 100 registered as individual experts. 21 Japanese NGO representatives participated physically in person. The registered number of NGO speakers at the Congress 44, ancillary meetings organized by or with NGOs 50. So that's not bad at all if you take those uh, figures together. On the 3rd of March, you might recall, the UNIDC Executive Director opened the NGO briefing, which was co-chaired by the Alliance and our own civil society unit within UNIDC. It was attended by 104 NGO representatives and other categories of participants registered in the Congress. We already mentioned uh, towards the uh, Kyoto Declaration, well, paragraphs 10 and paragraphs 15, I mean, refer to the need for multidisciplinary efforts and multi-stakeholder partnerships, such as the private sector, civil society, academia, and the scientific community, and with other relevant stakeholders as appropriate. But Michael is right. I mean, what was still included within the Doha Declaration is not longer there within the Kyoto one. There's no reference to faith-based organizations as such. Although evidently the NGOs consist of a wide range of very diverging viewpoints and experiences, they succeeded to coordinate and speak with one voice. And this was demonstrated by your joint statement made by the Alliance at the high level segment. Now that's on the positive side, but on the lessons learned and hopefully to be corrected in the future, the NGO launch on the tech platform regretfully did not attract the virtual crowds we had hoped for. Uh, virtual does attract a wider range of people who otherwise physically would not be able to be present in those wide ranging congresses, but nothing beats the physical contact to ent entertain lively on and off uh, record discussions and, and human encounters. A second lesson learned, as the Kyoto Declaration was agreed upon in, ad in advance of the Congress by member states, and the regional consultation processes ahead of the Congress included only a few civil society representatives, the views of civil society could have been better reflected within that declaration. And the Kyoto Declaration mentions the impact of COVID-19, but mainly in terms of challenges to criminal justice, with less focus on the issue of crime and violence prevention. Prevention is an element strongly underwritten, underwritten in your joint NGO statement at the Kyoto Congress. This said, I mean, within the chapter of the Kyoto Declaration, advancing crime prevention, there are great hooks for future action. And let me just um, quote a few here. There is uh, article paragraph 21, uh, which refers to addressing the causes, including the root causes and risk factors that make different segments of society more vulnerable to crime. I think that faith-based organizations really do have a role to play here within this one. 26, promote tailor-made crime prevention strategies that take into account local context, including by fostering among the general public a culture of lawfulness cognizant of cultural diversity. Again, a window of opportunity, I mean, to collaborate closely on this one. And the last one, which I quote here within, it's not uh, necessarily uh, the last one within the Kyoto Declaration, but which I think is, is interesting to put forward at this event, is empower youth to become active agents of positive change in their communities to support crime prevention efforts. Again, needless to say, I mean, this is an open invite as well for us to collaborate later on. Allow me to conclude with an interesting note. The main theme of the fourth UN Crime Congress, the fourth one in 1970, was hosted in Kyoto, half a century before its replay in this beautiful city. And the theme of that fourth UN Crime Congress in 1970 was how to coordinate and intensify crime prevention efforts within the context of social and economic development. As all things human, criminal justice is bound to evolution. 
And an interesting little fact too is that the 97 Kyoto was the first time ever a crime Congress came up with an official declaration. A one pager, mind you, a one pager. The full name was perhaps longer than the one page. The full name was the Fourth UN Crime Congress on the Prevention of Crime and the Treatment of Offenders. And after a short preamble, the declaration contained only three articles. The first article calling member states to take action. The second article urging for international cooperation and the United Nations to provide technical assistance. And the third and last one, ensuring that the structures are in place to effectuate the above. Those, my dear friends, were apparently much simpler times than what we face today. The declaration of the 14th UN Crime Congress resulted in 13 pages and none less than 97 articles. The distinguished participants, our world definitely has become far more complex. We are counting on civil society to work with us to help member states take forward the commitments made at the Crime Congress to advance crime prevention and criminal justice, to build fairer, more inclusive and more resilient societies, helping the world recover better and get back on track to achieving the sustainable development goals. And those nice words were not mine. Those were the words expressed by my executive director at the session, the opening session of the Kyoto Congress with civil society organizations on March the 3rd. With this, co-chairs, it's my pleasure to give you the floor back. Many thanks for your kind attention. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Jean-Luc Lemieux. Uh, you're truly uh, an encyclopedia of information uh, and a great historian. So we very much welcome your uh, leading us off for this uh, important discussion and giving us uh, good data as well as very important historical perspective. Thank you very much. And uh, I note you're uh, giving honor and respect to the government of Japan and we're very proud and uh, very pleased and appreciative that we have with us His Excellency Takeshi Ikihara. He's the Ambassador Extraordinary Plenipotentiary Permanent Representative of Japan to the International Organizations in Vienna, serving in that post since 2019. Ambassador Higihara, you have the floor, sir. Okay, I hope I'm connected, yes. yes. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fraza, Dr. Walsh, uh, fellow speakers, and dear uh, online participants. Uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this event. and. Uh, for this valuable opportunity to speak about the Kyoto Declaration and a very important role of civil society and faith-based organizations. Um, let me first begin with a, a very brief background. The little over a month ago, between March the 7th and 12th, Japan hosted the uh, 14th United, Congress, United Nations Congress on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice, or Kyoto Congress in Kyoto. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Jan Luc, for uh, remind us, uh, reminding us that uh, actually the Kyoto is uh, one of the most important uh, religious and spiritual uh, chapter of Japan since the uh, ninth century. Um, the overall theme of the uh, Congress was advancing crime uh, prevention, criminal justice, and the rule of law towards the achievement of the 2030 agenda. Uh, this is a very important because the Kyoto uh, Congress was the first Congress to be organized after the adoption of the SDGs. Obviously, the COVID-19 uh, posed a huge uh, challenges uh, for us to organize uh, international event of this dimension. But unfortunately, the, uh, the Congress turned uh, to be uh, a substantial success. With a uh, record number of participants, uh, some 5,000 people uh, took part from all over the world including the representatives of no less than 140 non-government organizations, both in person and online. The record, uh, this record demonstrated how we can uphold multilateralism despite the current challenges posed by the COVID-19. We had active participation on civil, of civil society and 
faith-based organizations at the Congress. I note with high appreciation the statement delivered by Dr. Plaza on behalf of the coalition to the Congress, uh, to the Congress plenary, as well as the coalition's participation in several ancillary meetings. The adoption of the Kyoto Congress was one of the key outcomes of the Congress. Uh, this declaration will serve as a roadmap for the advancement of crime prevention and criminal justice for the next four years. And additionally, I, I should say that uh, this was some of the uh, personally uh, emotional moment because I have spent almost two years chairing the uh, negotiation uh, to each consensus of uh, this declaration. One of the prominent achievements of the Kyoto Declaration is the strong emphasis on multi stakeholder partnerships. In paragraph 10 of the Kyoto Declaration, the international community made a commitment to engaging in and fostering multi stakeholder partnerships in our effort to prevent and combat crime. The furthermore, a specific references to multi stakeholder partnerships with regard to addressing specific issues such as responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, reducing the reoffending, as well as supporting the uh, rehabilitation and reintegration of offenders. Our Justice Minister, Kamikawa, who chaired the Congress, made a powerful closing statement uh, at the Congress, highlighting their importance. Much you think all the partnerships may Bring, uh, bringing a diverse range of stakeholders to the policy making and policy implementing table. It enables us to mobilize our unique capacities and expertises to advance our common goals. Integrating civil society into our crime prevention and criminal justice efforts is essential to ensure not only accountability but also efficiency. It is clear that governments cannot achieve their goals alone. For example, when we release offenders from prison, we need the community and the people to assist uh, in their reintegration. And civil society organizations have an important role to play in this regard. It is also the same in, uh, for instance, assisting victims of crime. And the list goes on and on. I understand that faith based organizations have a long established role in crime prevention and criminal justice and therefore have a unique level of expertise. One area which I believe is of particular importance is the rehabilitation and reintegration of offenders. For instance, the provision of agent services in prison or face-based activities to support reaching offenders and the communities they belong to. The Kyoto Declaration envisions a potential expansion of the role of the civil society. Indeed, through the references to much stakeholder partnerships, civil society, including our base based organizations, are invited to play a more active role and bring their unique uh, expertise and valuable viewpoints into all relevant areas in uh, preventing and combating crime. Uh, this is particularly relevant under the current uh, COVID 19 pandemic situation. The pandemic was hit harder, vulnerable members of the society. So we need to make uh, the importance of the civil uh, society uh, or the including the face based organization uh, is uh, particularly relevant in the current juncture of COVID-19. Uh, the pandemic uh, hit harder the vulnerable members of our society. We need to make great efforts to support them in order to uphold the SDGs principle of the one. Mr. Ambassador, we, we seem to be disconnected. I'm sorry, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, my apologies. Uh, I think we will need to move on to uh, our next speaker and hopefully things will get sorted out, Mr. Ambassador, in time for the discussion. So I hope you'll stay tuned and find a way to address the technical problem. Uh, we're very much appreciative for your intervention and uh, elaboration on the declaration, particularly paragraph 10 and calling for a strong uh, 
uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships with civil society and faith-based organizations. And we very much appreciate that endorsement uh, and look forward to ongoing collaboration. Uh, I, I'll next invite His Excellency Aftab Koker. He's the ambassador of Pakistan to Austria, Slovakia, and the United Nations in Vienna and served in many academic posts. We're very proud that he's appeared uh, on previous occasions on behalf of the work of the coalition. And we're very proud uh, to have you with us today. Ambassador Aftab Kokar. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thomas Wallace and uh, Dr. Michael Plaster for giving me this opportunity. I think uh, uh, it speaks of the level of commitment and efficiency on your part that uh, you have planned to organize this event as a follow-up of the Kyoto Conference, which shows your determination. So uh, I'm grateful for that uh, and I really commend that. But at the outset, let me appreciate the Japanese government's generous hospitality. But at the same time, I would like to express my deepest appreciation the way Ambassador of Japan conducted the negotiations in the last two years to build a consensus on this declaration. So we must commend that effort, his personal uh, contribution into this declaration, and we owe him a lot. So to, today, I will speak uh, in two parts. First is briefly to uh, capture what is happening in terms of uh, 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 in terms of hate speech, hated, and uh, uh, lack of interfaith harmony. That is where uh, the role of uh, FPOs is uh, relevant, is important. Uh, because given the current tensions within our societies and amongst nations, the idea of uh, interfaith harmony has assumed, I, I, I believe, much more greater relevance and urgency and importance. Because uh, uh, interfaith cooperation serves as a powerful antidote uh, to counter such trends of hate speech. I'll just uh, uh, touch upon uh, the, the tendencies in, 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 uh, in, in our recent times, and most importantly, I'll draw your attention to the incidents of desecration of the Holy Quran in Norway and Sweden and reprinting of caricatures of Prophet, peace be upon him, by French magazine Charlie Hebdo. And uh, uh, the reason I'm quoting this, uh, it, is, it has uh, created uh, some waves uh, and uh, reactions in various uh, Muslim countries, and especially in Pakistan these days. So that is where I think I will uh, suggest uh, uh, FPOs to come forward and to play their role in countering this, these tendencies and uh, to, uh, to start a debate that where freedom of expression should uh, uh, take a pause and give space to uh, strong religious feelings which are uh, carried by the followers of different religions and in this case, uh, uh, Muslims because we consider Holy Prophet to be a personality which cannot be uh, used to uh, create humor or to criticize by using the platform or slogan of freedom of expression. So moving on to Kyoto Conference Declaration, I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Michael Plaza referred to uh, and uh, expressed his disappointment on absence of a three word phrase. FPO. I, I, I share your uh, sentiment. Uh, maybe uh, in, in future, uh, uh, we can make a, a more concerted effort to, to see how uh, uh, the reference can be incorporated and appreciation of the role of these organizations can be put in place in, in the right context. Uh, if we look at the declaration itself, uh, I have gone through uh, uh, in detail, once again, although we negotiated, but again, to prepare for today's engagement, I, I thought let's go through this text and how we can draw upon different provisions of this declaration and relate it to 
your mandate, your organization's uh, uh, objectives. First of all, if you look at uh, uh, one of the agenda items of the conference was uh, multi-dimensional approaches by governments to promote rule of law. I think that is exactly related to FBO's mandate. Then uh, uh, if you look at the uh, article two, again, the governments have undertaken through their heads of states to promote rule of law through multidimensional approaches. Again, what are those multidimensional? I think interfaith harmony is one of the key approaches which we can use in terms of crime prevention, criminal justice, then strengthening international cooperation, uh, Article 5 in the uh, operating part. That is where FBO has a role. Then in nine, Article 9, it's again, we take a responsibility as states as a primary role of states and governments in defining crime prevention strategy and policies. It means there is a secondary role for other actors, for other stakeholders. Who are those stakeholders? FBO is one of the civil society, NGOs, academic circles, research organizations, they have an important role. Then Article 10 calls for fostering multi-stakeholder partnerships. I think FBO should draw on that uh, uh, article and start uh, some concrete work, work on the ground. Then if you look at uh, uh, Article 18, it says that we strongly reaffirm this responsibility of all states to fully promote and protect all human rights and fundamental freedoms, as well as to uphold the principle of human dignity. That is where I think faith is all about human dignity. No religion denies human dignity. And we should, uh, I think, cash on this uh, provision of the declaration. Then the first part is advancing crime prevention. It means we have to build our societies in a way that we prevent crime instead of working after the crime happens. And then we move on to uh, justice, prosecution. I think the first and preliminary stage is crime prevention. And uh, I'm grateful to you, DC director. He has drawn attention, different provisions of this uh, portion. I will not repeat that. But let's move on to another important uh, uh, element uh, is improving prison conditions. I think once uh, a criminal is uh, prosecuted and given punishment, that is the phase where I think religion's faith can play an important role in recreating a personality out of that criminal personality. I think that is where and we, we are aware that the prison conditions, uh, particularly in developing countries, are not uh, desired, up to the desired mark. That is where uh, I think FPOs can play an important role. So if you look at uh, uh, Article 40, raise awareness of the importance of public acceptance of offenders. So, okay, criminal justice has been done the person is now coming back to the society. Will he be accepted? How will he be accepted? How we can help him to reintegrate in the society where he was uh, uh, living before going to the prison. Then uh, Article 42 is about facilities. Again, talking about uh, usefulness uh, into the societies. Can we equip them, train them during their uh, a punishment period with certain skills so they can come back to the society and play a, a, an important role and be helpful to the society. Then the other segment is uh, of the De Kyoto Declaration is promoting the rule of law. Again, I think a lot of uh, people suffer because they don't have resources to uh, to defend them during the uh, prosecution, during the investigation. That is, uh, FPUs can do uh, by providing affordable legal assistance to those individuals who are suffering from 
lack of resources. Again, another element is what kind of punishment is given? Is it, is, is it proportionate to the to crime committed by the person or it is um, much more severe, which goes against and beyond the human dignity? That is again a campaign to be launched that punishment should be proportionate to the person and looking at his credentials, past record. Then Article 58 again talks about increased public awareness of means of reporting instances of uh, criminal activities. Uh, I, we can move on, but I will stop here and uh, uh, once again uh, draw attention how uh, we collectively as societies, as individuals can contribute to this important element. Our religion, Islam, uh, teaches us that we respect diversity, we, res we should promote tolerance. And that is where I think Pakistan, uh, the, the constitution of Pakistan has very clear provisions. And I will uh, at the end uh, reiterate, recall that uh, the uh, action by, taken by Pakistan by opening up a Kartarpur corridor by six pilgrims from India and all over the world as an example of uh, uh, religious uh, multi-diversity, religious tolerance. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Ambassador, Your Excellency Coker. Uh, thank you for acknowledging the great work of Ambassador Hikihara in developing and the, working with the team to produce the declaration uh, along with others and uh, really going through a number of the items and articles within the declaration, very helpful, pointing to the ways in which FBOs are indeed partners in this effort and uh, precisely hitting on the topic of our program, which is next steps for faith-based organizations. So you've, you really hit on a, a number of them, crime prevention, rule of law, human dignity, partnerships and rehabilitation and reintegration. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, we now turn to uh, the chair of the Alliance of NGOs for Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice, a good friend of the coalition, and we're very happy she's with us today. Please now hear from Dr. Ana Alvazi Del Frate, chair of the Alliance of NGOs. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you, Michael. And uh, as usual, as with your uh, events, uh, this is all uh, very inspiring. And uh, thank you very much for the, uh, let's say, uh, publicity to the Alliance. Uh, uh, the Alliance has uh, really proudly uh, sponsored, co-sponsored all your events, uh, the series of uh, webinars of the Coalition of Faith-Based Organizations. And, uh, and is very happy to, to, to be here. And thank you also to Jean-Luc Lemayeux for mentioning all these uh, um, numbers and all these things about, uh, about the Congress that indeed was, uh, uh, was a fantastic uh, novelty in terms of uh, the virtual participation, but unfortunately confirmed that the fact that uh, really we need to be there, we need to be there in, in person, and uh, and there is not much that we can do uh, to to replace uh, the the unique uh, feeling of participation of in person participation. That is also where the ideas uh, can be better uh, developed, better understood, and uh, and advanced. So uh, we are we are here to uh, to talk uh, not not only about uh, what is in uh, uh, the, the Kyoto Declaration. It's uh, it's something that uh, unfortunately was uh, uh, negotiated without the participation of uh, of civil society, and uh, we we really hope that in the future it will be possible to to have uh, the possibility to to. At least to discuss some some of these issues, uh, so that uh, the, the the document will become really more holistic. Uh, it is true that there is this umbrella paragraph, paragraph ten, that is uh, um, referring to the participation of civil society at large. Um, it is a sort of all-encompassing uh, text. 
the, there is here and there in the declaration reference uh, to relevant stakeholders or multi-stakeholders uh, to, to indicate that uh, uh, partnerships are necessary to carry out uh, the, these commitments. But uh, uh, for me, what, what, I, what I miss a bit is, uh, is the fact that we are in this together. So uh, the commitment uh, is made, uh, you will notice, is made on behalf of uh, the heads of states and government ministers and the representatives of member states. So it's not like in the past. In the past, it was uh, we the states. Now, uh, the commitment is made really by very well identified uh, authorities. Uh, but but then to to implement this program, uh, the the participation of many many actors is uh, is really necessary. And uh, uh, and what we we suffer a bit is this uh, distancing. So it's the fact that there is a perception of uh, somebody who wrote the declaration and somebody else then who, who is not in. What Michael said at the beginning that that you are sorry that faith based organizations are not mentioned and and this should not be because uh, the the perception should be a holistic commitment something that is for everybody it is for societies it, it is for the international community it is something that after all is is a big piece of the uh, 2030 agenda of the of the sustainable development goals and the language in there it's much more inclusive and it is really uh, more clearly indicating the participation and, and everyone uh, can find a role, can find, uh, a, 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 can have a feeling of ownership uh, of this that sometimes uh, we, we, we miss a bit. But uh, let's see, I will stop complaining <laughs> because uh, I think that we have to see the glass uh, half full. First of all, the Congress is really the celebration of the uh, of the civil society of the of the fact that uh, the uh, um, the connection between the practitioners, between the experts, uh, and uh, and the governments uh, is happening at the Congress. And the Congress is is really a jewel. It's something that should be preserved as uh, the 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 forum, uh, the the opportunity. Uh, to uh, to meet and have these different uh, um, uh, different parts of the international community meet and discuss. Uh, I think that we should really be grateful for the opportunity that we had with the government of Japan uh, promoting actively uh, the um, this type of discussion, even with the, the constraints, uh, even. Uh, in this situation, uh, we, we hope there will be another opportunity to go to Japan to uh, to to continue this this type of discussion in uh, in the future. And the um, what what I see uh, in terms of a positive thing is really the importance that is attached to to the Congress and uh, the. Um, lively discussions that happen, for example, in the workshops, for example, in other parts that are um, complementing what, what we see in the, in the declaration, but uh, they may have, let's say, unpacked some, some of, the, of the parts in a, in a more operational way, in a more uh, uh, say, uh, detailed way. Um, as uh, uh, Jean-Luc mentioned before, uh, the Alliance uh, made a statement in the high-level le segment on behalf of civil society at large. And uh, this statement reflected the results of a survey that we carried out uh, among the members of the Alliance. And uh, uh, of course, what, what we saw uh, were uh, certain priorities uh, perceived by, by our members that in part mirror the, the, the topics that are included in the uh, Kyoto Declaration. And so what we would like to do is uh, to, to establish a, a, a path uh, so that we uh, have the possibility to 
continue the discussion. Uh, we will start this uh, uh, on the occasion of the uh, Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice that will be in week uh, 17 to 21st of May. During that week, there will be events that will uh, continue this type of discussion about operationalizing and, uh, and, and moving on in the implementation of the Kyoto Declaration. And um, not only, uh, let's say, from a, a, let's say a, a process a point of view, but also from a substantive point of view. And in this respect, uh, we are uh, promoting a series of uh, webinars, substantive webinars, that will touch uh, on uh, some of the priorities that have been identified by our members. And so uh, some are already uh, being discussed in working groups that we have within uh, the Alliance. <clears throat> For example, we have one on global urban safety. We have another group that is dealing with domestic violence at the time of, uh, of COVID. And uh, um, we are working on uh, uh, organized crime related issues. So issues related to transnational organized crime and how civil society uh, uh, works uh, from this point of view, especially on the assistance to victims. So uh, stay tuned and thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, back to you, Tom. Yeah, thank you very much, Anna, for very, uh, as always, a very uh, insightful and uh, uh, well-presented uh, background. Uh, and I like your emphasis that the glass is half full. Uh, thank you very much. I, I want to now turn uh, to Ms. Lucy Leonard. She's the director of the Canadian Center for Justice and Community Safety Statistics, Department of Justice. Of Canada. We're very happy she's with us today, Miss Leonard. Yes, thank you for the invitation, Excellency, guest, and colleague. I also had the opportunity to, part to be part of the Canadian delegation for the 14th Congress in Kyoto. And uh, we also like to extend our uh, thanks to the government of Japan. It was a great event, and uh, we really appreciate it the, to, to be part of it uh, as well. Uh, the first uh, hybrid model for, for all of us and an example. Um, so for, for me, um, at Statistic Canada, we, uh, we are a key partners uh, with other government department and agency in support of the SDG and reporting on progress of the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development. And as part of the main workshop one uh, at the Congress was uh, on evidence base. This is where uh, I participated and uh, made the statement on behalf of the government of Canada in terms of building the evidence uh, based crime prevention, statistic indicators and evaluation in support of successful practice. So this, it's in this context that I'll, uh, I'll, I'll raise a few of uh, my points uh, today. I have three. But prior to this, um, yeah, so I'll leave on, on, on this first one. Uh, I have two examples, but first few of the, the remark in terms of the context of the conversation in enhancing evidence-based crime prevention strategy to the collection and analysis of data uh, that we saw in Kyoto and with UNODC was on the importance of using systemic and coherent criteria and using an enhancing existing standard and classification. And part of the Kyoto uh, Declaration on Building Evidence supports the need to have uh, these international tools, such as norms, standards, and indicators to share the information and for all of us to have a dialogue, build consensus, as it was mentioned before, and develop and also adjust our legal and policy framework. So another uh, important discussion then that took place in Kyoto uh, as part of the main workshop and other auxiliary events on uh, evidence and statistic and data uh, was also on addressing the data gaps, which uh, in the justice system in particular, but also have we seen in the context of the pandemic now uh, worldwide uh, that uh, we have many information and data and needs and data gaps. And, and this was raised at the Kyoto uh, Conference, Cong uh, the Crown Congress, in terms of the need for improvement of the quality um, of the available data on crime trends in particular, and considering uh, the development of statistical indicators and sharing of such data to strengthen our capacity 
to better understand uh, the global crime trends and provide information to in terms of the effectiveness of crime prevention um, and victimization. So in particular, the focus on building evidence base uh, with data and statistics for us in the Canadian context has been uh, in terms of approaching a variety of uh, way we can uh, better collect data uh, on whether it's transnational crime, aid crime, uh, human trafficking. Uh, so this is where I'm going to kind of turn to three uh, main example of how we can do this work uh, and more importantly, how it needs to be done. So maybe I'll turn to um, the first, uh, maybe the next one. So the three main points for us uh, in Kyoto that we discussed was uh, the, the need for uh, more timely data. So that would be the first main highlight we uh, discussed and UNODC led the discussion as part of the workshop one on this, in terms of uh, being able to have this data in a more timely manner to understand the dynamics of crime, of the justice and police system and to better inform policy. And again, we've seen in COVID, uh, the situation that has created in the justice system, so how we could better understand. So as we've done this work, that's one of example where uh, we've done, we've tried to do data collection uh, during uh, the pandemic on um, selected police reported crime and also call for services. So this is why this one is, this is not the, as many of you would know in the justice system, it takes time. So again, can we be more responsive and more timely? That was raised in the context of uh, Kyoto. And this is one example where it can be done, but it is challenging. So that's one of uh, the, the first point in terms of having more timely data. We can do it, but it requires uh, time and partnership. And that's why again, uh, civil society as well can help uh, in terms of gathering this data. Uh, the other one, I would turn to the uh, other slide um, is in terms of having um, more uh, uh, data to address the data gap. So as we have an example here, I think would, would be relevant in the context of the conversation uh, today for um, the need to have more information on the characteristic of victims and also uh, offenders. For uh, example, for us in Canada is the A crime. So as we see now, uh, we gather some data in terms of what are the trends, um, and uh, what are the motive for eight crimes in Canada with uh, some of the uh, information we're able to have. And also, again, there was raised in the Kyoto context to have more granularity uh, to, to kind of what we call the, a bit more a deep dive into some of these data to understand. And as you know, to in the context of COVID, hate crime as taking uh, also a high importance and try to understand and also address and combat uh, this important issue. Um, so the next one uh, we would see in terms of when we say about uh, a crime by religion. So this is what in Canada, in terms of the various uh, religious group, uh, overall it is on the decline, but then again, you know, we're able to uh, try to address uh, uh, collecting information that's a bit more detailed and then that could help us also better understand and also address uh, what, what, what are the crime uh, issues in Canada and how we can um, also inform prevention uh, strategies to combat and address uh, a crime in the Canadian context. I don't have a slide on this, but another example I would say uh, that's very important for us as well in Canada, and I think it's been a lead uh, and, and working, I think, more in the future with the various organizations has been on gender-based violence as well. There's been great work done in terms of uh, trying to address uh, gender-based violence uh, uh, and looking at different surveys in private space, in public space, and also expanding the definition uh, beyond what we would call the criminal threshold. So um, different kind of uh, behavior. So again, uh, that as well resonates with civil society in terms of uh, uh, what do we do to understand uh, crime and victimization and safety more than um, police reported crime and uh, information uh, existing maybe on victim that we know uh, ha has a lot of uh, uh, gaps. So the last, uh, then the next one, the, the last example, uh, I would give in terms of the context uh, for us in addressing uh, 
and reinforcing in the Kyoto Declaration for building evidence is the need to uh, establish and explore new uh, methods of, of collection. And again, COVID has created challenges, but also opportunities. So us, this is an example here where uh, via crowdsourcing, we have been able during the COVID period to um, assess the perception of safety uh, among Canadians and various uh, groups. So that was, uh, you know, it's not again a nationally representative sample, but it's a way to assess the pulse and give you information uh, in terms of, uh, you know, at a critical time of uh, where, uh, you know, citizens are standing and how they're perceiving, um, you know, uh, the situation. And that's what we're able to do during COVID with about 45,000 Canadian that responded to this crowdsource. And uh, so from uh, issues of violence in the home to uh, the way some visible minority, particular vulnerable group felt during the pandemic. So again, uh, it's how we're able to try to get better data, more information on assessing uh, some of the issues uh, related to crime and victimization. And uh, that, again, very much in line with the discussion that took place in Kyoto and on this part of the declaration on the need to build evidence and better data and improving system and collaboration at, at the international level. I would say in terms of closing um, remarks for um, our participation in Kyoto and uh, statement made by the government of Canada and the work we're doing uh, here as well across the country that you know is a very vast one, very diverse, is the, all the work we do in moving forward and building the evidence and where we've been uh, successful in doing that is um, in building trust first in our institution and engaging uh, with respect, humility, but also a lot of agility with uh, traditional and non-traditional partners. So some people would see the faith-based organization as a less traditional partners, but this is where um, I think government uh, has been also uh, not so much, I would say challenge, but to think about the importance of involving uh, such organization in moving forward the work in validating and facilitating um, for us, you know, in terms of uh, whether we want to collect information and have conversation to, to better inform the justice and police system. Uh, so this is where we see uh, such organization uh, fundamental and us, that's why we've been uh, very successful in advancing uh, this kind of data, information, evidence, which really at the end of the day, sometime what is also often sensitive subject. So again, with civil society, uh, this is where the partnership is very vital and important uh, in advancing, working towards uh, first achieving, as I said, we have a great commitment uh, in terms of reporting on the SDG, but also in terms of measuring uh, progress for, for this agenda moving forward. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Lucy Leonard. And uh, now we understand better, I do, what the Canadian Center for Justice and Community Safety Statistics does. And it's extremely important work. And uh, uh, I could uh, begin to see the importance of this uh, gathering of timely data. And the data you showed is very helpful in terms of hate crimes or gender-based violence and discussion of new methods. So thank you. You brought a, a very, very important and uh, valuable uh, perspective to our discussion. I'm grateful that thank you need time to be here. Uh, but we need to move quickly on uh, toward uh, Mr. Ian Tennant as our next speaker. He's the fund manager and uh, Vienna multilateral representative for the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime with the UN Office of Drugs and Crime. Please, you now have the floor, Mr. Ian Tennant. Um, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to you and all your colleagues for inviting uh, me to take uh, part in one of these seminars. It's my uh, first time, and it's impressive to see the range of speakers that you have and to look back at what you have been organizing uh, and achieving over recent months, including at the Congress uh, in Kyoto uh, itself. 
Um, and I should also say, as, as well as my role within the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime, I'm also the Vice Chair of uh, the NGO Alliance on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice, uh, of which uh, Anna uh, is the chair. Um, I would like to start by saying that I know that the purpose of this meeting is to look ahead, uh, but I think as we look ahead, it's also important to look back and to understand the context of how civil society is or is not able to engage uh, with the United Nations and with member states. And to be frank, the reality for civil society, including faith-based organizations, is challenging. Countries are becoming more confident in uh, obstructing or blocking civil society engagement and access to UN meetings. And we saw this at the Crime Congress itself, where one country in particular attempted to block a major university and a professional association from different countries from, from attending the Congress. And that's quite something when you consider the history and the background of the Congress itself, where civil society has been historically central to the discussions, to the organization, and to the outcomes of the Crime Congress. And this uh, hostile environment uh, reflects the reality that we see on the ground in countries, not just at the UN, where we see NGOs in general, but NGOs in particular that look at organized crime, corruption, and justice issues are sometimes persecuted by states for either for uncovering unwelcome truths or links between politics, business, and crime, or simply for providing services in communities where the state is either unable or unwilling to provide the protection and the justice that comes uh, that's needed due to organized crime. And as I said earlier, and as has been um, discussed already in this event, civil society has a central role and should have a central role at the Congress. But over the years, the Congress has become more of an intergovernmental body and less of an expert and independent body. And this change can be traced back to the creation in the early 90s of the UN Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice the CCPCJ. And the CCPCJ as an intergovernmental body is now essentially the organizing committee, the organizing body of the UN Crime Congress. And the Congress itself has gradually taken on those characteristics. Uh, traditionally, the outcome declarations or the range of resolutions that were agreed and, uh, uh, and produced by the Crime Congress when it met every five years uh, including in 1970 in, uh, in the first Congress in Kyoto, were representative to some extent of the discussions at the Congress. It was adopted at the end, after all the delegates had listened and debated and brought new ideas. But now, since 2015 in Doha, the 13th Crime Congress, and this year in Japan, the outcome declaration was agreed by member states in Vienna before the Congress had even started. And there was no opportunity for civil society to input into this progress, uh, into this process, uh, aside from a regional preparatory process uh, where there were five regional meetings held and only 15 NGOs uh, were invited or attended um, those meetings. And this state led process is reflected in the content of the Kyoto Declaration itself. The declaration demonstrates how the process has become more state-centric and less inclusive and supportive of civil society. At the Congress itself, we had many supportive statements. Uh, Japan included made very positive statements about civil society, multi-stakeholder partnerships, as did many other countries. But this is not reflected in the consensus-based uh, declaration that was adopted. It continues a trend of gradually watering down the support for civil society in resolutions and in the declarations of the Crime Congress. If you look back to uh, the year 2000, the Crime Congress in Vienna, you see in this declaration that civil society is described as a partner and actor of government and the UN. And over the years, it gradually gets weaker until we get to Kyoto, where we have a new uh, sentence, which is uh, appearing for the first time, so emphasizing the primary role and responsibility of states and governments and demoting civil society to a support 
row. And in addition to the declaration, the, the, the experience for civil society at the Crown Congress was also challenging. You know, this is in part due to COVID, uh, but it also didn't help that there were sometimes arbitrary limits and restrictions put on how civil society um, could engage. Very few speaking slots in the plenary and in the committee and restrictions on the numbers of civil society delegates that could be um, um, registered by each organization. Clearly, as we move forward, if we want to have a more comprehensive and uh, effective impact on crime prevention and criminal justice, more support for the role and more recognition for the role of civil society is needed and something needs to change. But today we're looking forward and we, we're looking at how to implement this declaration. I think what we can do through our actions um, and through our engagements is to ensure that the commitment to multi-stakeholder partnerships that's included in the declaration is put into practice and demonstrated and publicized so that there is no longer doubt or argument about the value that community-based organizations and independent voices bring to enrich and improve the response to and prevention of organized crime. And as Anna mentioned and Jean-Luc mentioned, this will be discussed at the CCPCJ next uh, next month at a side event organized by NGO Alliance and UNODC. And this will start a process of discussion and debate on this issue. And what we can do through this process is to rebuild the understanding of and respect for civil society as a partner and actor in crime prevention and criminal justice. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ian Tennant, for really a, a very focused and uh, well laid out uh, argument and uh, called to the attention of uh, the need for to live up to this ideal of partnership with civil society and, uh, and faith-based organizations. So I'm very, uh, very pleased to have this important perspective and, and intervention and kind of help us understand what's you know, probably been a long-standing tension between the role of the states and uh, and civil society, and how to turn that into a very productive, uh, effective, efficient partnership. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, our final speaker uh, before the discussion begins, uh, when I'll turn it over to Michael Platzer, is uh, none other than Professor Irvin Waller, Professor Emeritus University, University of Ottawa author of the book, Science and Secrets of Ending Violet, Violent Crime, and also of the book, Smarter Crime Control, A Guide to a Safer Future for Citizens, Communities, and Politicians. Uh, we're very happy to have you here, uh, Dr. Waller. The floor is yours. So I'd like to take us back to 1985 when the governments of the world adopted a Declaration on Rights for Victims. And that drew attention to the harm that crime was doing to victims and the need to do something about it. In 2015, the leaders of the world, the governments of the world, committed to the SDGs. And SDG 16, but also SDG 5, include statements like reducing violence significantly. Now, there are a number of uh, challenges that we have to face as governments, as faith-based organizations, and as civil society. And those that are most important to me are that we still have half a million homicides every year, that we have 25 million or more women raped, and that we, according to the WHO, we have close to 1 billion children who are victims of violence. So the Kyoto Declaration has some good phrases, and these were mentioned uh, by several of the speakers this morning. We're going to address causes, including root causes. We're going to be more evidence-based, and we're going to uh, treasure what we, we're going to measure what we treasure. We're going to have tailor-made strategies. We're going to have a gender perspective. We're going to worry about involving children and youth. 
And these are great. These are really important that the governments uh, came to these conclusions. But the issue is what will happen? Will we actually see the governments taking the decisive action to change those statistics, to bring them down, to save lives, to protect women and children? Because the world that we're living in today has that knowledge. And this was just not in the declaration. It has to be there at the commission. It has to be there at ECOSOC. It has to be there at the General Assembly. We have scientifically proven prevention programs that weren't mentioned in the declaration. You only have to look at what the World Health Organization has been saying this. We don't see even cooperation between UNODC and WHO at the level that it has to happen. We see guidelines agreed by ECOSOC on the recommendations of, the, uh, of previous Congresses, uh, and we don't see these mentioned. We have UN Habitat setting out guidelines. We have, importantly, cities that have reduced violence by 50% or more. But we don't see in this declaration, and I hope we will see at the Commission, the actions that are needed to actually accelerate our shift towards making a difference and achieving those eminently important goals that were indirectly specified in 85 and very directly specified in 2015. This means we have to have investment in violence prevention for development. High levels of violence in Latin America mean that uh, GDP is not advancing. We know that if you invest in violence prevention, the IBD into American Development Bank has told us this, that you will increase GDP, particularly important after COVID. We know that there are safety monitor tools that Habitat has developed, <clears throat> but we need those intergovernmental organizations, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, to invest in training. We need to encourage the initiatives that civil society groups like cities have already taken. But this means that governments and those intergovernmental organizations must cooperate it, uh, around it. We need governments who agree to the Kyoto Declaration to do the things that will make it happen. They're going to need to have a focus on long-term causes that a permanent office for violence prevention would establish as ECOSOC agreed following the uh, 2000 uh, Congress. We need to be tackling the risk factors for violence using the knowledge that WHO and others have raised. And we need to raise awareness. It's so warming for me to hear so many speakers here today saying you have to get at the roots of violence and not just tackle the branches, uh, that we need to get to it before it happens. But words are not enough. We have to have actions and we have to have accelerator actions. We have to help cities who are really at the leadership of making a difference to use the proven prevention, to follow those guidelines that the UN in various um, silos has developed to tackle the causes and risk factors. But they also need funding to make it happen. So my appeal today is that uh, the civil society and faith-based organizations with the leadership from governments who believe in the statements in the Kyoto uh, Declaration will actually get what are called accelerators. WHO is already doing this on a modest basis, but they don't have the resources on violence prevention that UNODC uh, has and the links to government. So my plea is that we will move from a wonderful declaration that the Japanese government and all those governments can be proud of, that we move from a statement to actual decisive actions that will mean, and we need those now, that will mean that we will save lives, maybe 200,000 lives a year by 2030, that's achievable. Maybe 15 million women who aren't raped every year by 2030. And hundreds of millions of children who are not victims of violence. These are achievable, but we have to listen to the Secretary General 
and to the speeches that were made in 2015. And we need to transform the way we do business. We can't go on just having nice statements and doing little about it. We have to take those statements and turn them into reality. Thank you so much for including me in this panel. And thank you so much for a very stimulating uh, webinar today that I will be uh, distributing and promoting in every way possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irvin, and uh, very appropriate that you wrap it up in, uh, in terms of the panelists' presentations with this call to action, accelerated action, in fact, and uh, collaboration among the various stakeholders, the, including uh, WHO and ECOSOC, General Assembly, UN, ODC, working together with civil society, faith-based organizations, your message, take action. Uh, we're going to now invite uh, all the panelists uh, with us to come forward, uh, and, and Dr. Michael Platzer will now lead us in uh, addressing some questions to the panelists and drawing on some questions that have come from our audience. Michael? And the actually the first one, I think, is directed towards you. <laughs> um, someone is asking, what are the challenges that FBOs are facing, and how supportive are governments? Do you want to answer that, or should we let the, one of the ambassadors answer that one? Well, let's invite the panelists. I'm happy to, to weigh in on it, uh, take a stab okay. at it. All right. Can Ambassador Coker, can you take that question? Yes, sure. Uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity. I think uh, uh, there is uh, a quite of uh, uh, kind of uh, what, what they call the right word would be uh, uh, dilemma in terms of uh, uh, support to faith-based organizations and acknowledgement and recognition uh, uh, by the governments. Because at times, it, uh, in, uh, I'm talking from my, uh, my perspective, from Pakistan's perspective, where uh, there has been a suspicion about what kind of role religion-based organizations are uh, I'll say political parties are playing. So uh, uh, that is a separate, I, I suppose it's not what FPUs are. If that identity is separate, then of course, uh, uh, FPUs in Pakistan are very active in, in philanthropic activities. They are doing a lot when there are natural disasters and, uh, and other situations, but uh, Beyond that, uh, I think there's uh, a lot of work which can be done, and there's a space to do that. Very good. Thank you. I have a, actually a second question for the ambassador. Uh, ambassador Coker, you mentioned the disrespect and the insult to our prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, on many occasions through freedom of speech. In your opinion, at what stage does the freedom of speech turn into freedom to insult and how do we stop this to happen while we give full respect to the freedom of speech? Thank you and God bless. I think uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, raise awareness that there are certain personalities which are uh, 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 the level of respect is beyond uh, any normal standards. So Prophet Muhammad peace upon him comes into that category and there should be no argument or question about uh, uh, making any negative comment on the personality of profit. I like uh, you have uh, uh, legislation uh, about uh, Holocaust. So uh, we respect that legislation and we sentiment that. So I think uh, it's not, I'm not drawing a parallel, but I'm saying if legislation can be done on that uh, uh, issue, and freedom of expression is restricted, the same can be done uh, on, on the respect of Holy Prophet. Uh, Mr. Tennant, uh, I perceive that indeed there exists a behind the scenes trend towards governance by a small community of unelected elite figures backed by power money. How can FBOs fight this? 
Um, well, it's a it's a pretty um, fundamental question. Um, through the work that uh, we do at the Global Initiative, I mean, the Global Initiative is not a faith-based organisation, but the Resilience Fund that I um, run supports over 80 small NGOs around the world, some of which are faith-based, small um, faith-based organisations and communities. And what they can do at the local level is um, to provide, um, you know, provide that community to stop violence, interrupt violence um, at the at the local level, and try and mitigate where those uh, where those figures are wielding um, too much influence, uh, and where criminals and politics become interlinked, uh, and kind of at the global level, I think what we're all trying to do is to make sure that when there's statements like you see in the Kyoto Declaration about the rule of law uh, and good governance, that that's being implemented in practice and that we're calling out and um, exposing, publicizing where that's, uh, where that's not being done and whether that's um, kind of high level cases of corruption, uh, whether it's links between um, politicians and criminal gangs uh, at the local level. Um, that's a role that all of us, civil society, whether faith-based or not faith-based, can, uh, can play a role. As someone uh, adds on to this, the international crime organizations get their money from criminal activity. How to internationally confiscate, block the resources of crime organizations? What do you think about the Madiski Act to uh, to enact it worldwide. Anyone want to take that one on? Corruption? Anna? No. Nobody wants that one. I can take that one. I think it's for the global one. initiative. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. Um, no, I'm, I'm very, very happy to take that one. And something else that we've been working on recently is uh, how, you know, how to bring together all the different instruments um, and initiatives that we have. And, you know, when you look at, you know, there's so much um, that we have at our disposal, whether it's the conventions on transnational organized crime, corruption, the G20, the FATF, whatever it is, they're all doing something, but what we're lacking is something that takes aim at the more fundamental problems. And I think, you know, there's a, you know, there's a big debate um, about sanctions. I'm not an expert in sanctions, but you can see when they're used by big, powerful countries, they they have effects. But I guess the challenge is how to build consensus and make them more universally applicable. But um, I'm getting into um, uh, a topic that I, I really don't know too much about. But I think it's the kind of the proliferation of these kind of sanctions regimes is something that's happening more. The UK is doing it, um, the EU is increasingly doing it, so it's um, definitely something that the big uh, players are thinking about doing more. If you allow me to pick on that one as well, uh, um, and, and good to see you, uh, uh, Irvin. I mean, it has been a while, so hopefully to see you back in Vienna, one of those uh, months to come, if that would be feasible, perhaps a crime commission already. Um, Allow me, I mean, to uh, bring in the uh, the upcoming June uh, United Nations General Assembly Special Session on Corruption. Uh, I think that will be uh, very important. It might not be enough. I mean, it is an intergovernmental framework, so compromises need to be made, but at least it gives impetus to the glue of, of, of crime, which is corruption. Um, you have, I mean, next to that, I mean, very parallel discussions. I mean, uh, one is very interesting, but in the context of uh, how can you create a better world, shape a better um, uh, environment post-pandemic? So not only reconstructing what we had before, but how do we do that better? And within that dialogue is a question, I mean, how can we ensure that we find the financing for this ambitious framework? Uh, we all know that the 2030 development agenda uh, uh, demands, I mean, uh, trillions of, of, of uh, US dollars. And in many countries, evidently, that money is not available at the time where the overseas development aid is going down as well. So the entire discussion about the illicit financial flows has come to the fore. 
I mean, how can we make sure, I mean, that we uh, stop that tax misinvoicing, which is contributing a lot of money, I mean, to those companies who shouldn't have it? Uh, how can we ensure that there is a more equitable way of taxing uh, um, the profits, the gains made, I mean, during the pandemic uh, time frame, where many among us have seen uh, uh, more difficult financial times, and others have seen a dramatic increase in funding. So there's an entire discussion ongoing as well. I mean, with now uh, Biden uh, suggesting I mean, to have a two-track discussion uh, within the OCDE on taxation. I mean, uh, the taxation of the tech companies, but as well, I mean, um, wealth taxation, for example. IMF is very much in the same uh, discussion involved. Now, another parallel stream is uh, related to the financial accountability and transparency integrity. Uh, Initiative FACTI, uh, which just came up uh, the 28th of February with a set of recommendations. It falls short from where they started. I mean, you might still recall that uh, some voices were really advocating an international court on corruption or against corruption. Uh, now, FACTI has not pursued that concept. I mean, it just would be uh, too difficult in the current situations. But there's a lot of thinking ongoing indeed. I mean, that uh, the way we have been acting on those illicit financial flows uh, is, is, is very insufficient from what the world demands today. And hopefully we can translate some of that in, in tangible action. Over to you again. Thank you. Uh, can I just add a comment here, Mike? I, I, I think it's really important to not only fight alligators, but to drain swamps. So uh, I think it's really important to do all these things to fight uh, corruption. But unfortunately, the history of the last 50 years is that we have not put money into reducing demand, into prevention. And I have a very simple tithing rule. If we could just get 10% of what we're spending badly or well on fighting after the fact, and we put that 10% into prevention. And the good thing about the Kyoto Declaration is it has many, many paragraphs on, on uh, prevention. We would actually significantly reduce organized crime and corruption. I could go on for some time. I'll leave it at that. Well, that's a, that's a good role for faith-based organizations to teach governments how to do tithing. <laughs> I'm serious. <clears throat> Yeah, um, well, there's a question. Uh, will this uh, document be another uh, piece of paper? Will we remember it as uh, the Cairo Declaration, the Brazil declarations, the first Kyoto? Will it disappear or does it have some feet that'll walk? Um, and then from Dr. Rator, we have one. Almost every country has laws against rape and violence against minors. Or the numbers of crimes are increasing every year. What are your concrete action plans to recommendations to FBO and to governments? Give us some hope. But this is not a, another paper. Well, am I allowed to answer that question? Because if I am, I, 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 we know what to do to uh, reduce homicides. We know what to do to reduce rapes. We know what to do to reduce violence against children. Uh, on some of those, we can measure whether we're making progress, which is very important to achieving progress. On others, the measures aren't quite so good. This is a question of uh, uh, governments with the help of UNODC, WHO, Habitat, UN Women, getting to know the things that work and looking at how they can transform from the status quo that is not achieving these anything like they need to to achieve the SDGs. And I repeat, the Secretary General talked about transformations. Kyoto Declaration is not transformational. It's, it's got the perspective. So the Commission and ultimately ECOSOC and of course governments have to do the things that are transformational. They have to train people around the knowledge and around prevention. They have to uh, 
set targets and measure, as um, Lucy Leonard talked about today. These have to be part of uh, uh, policy making. We need to get the intergovernmental banks, um, particularly in relation to uh, Latin America, to do the training, the awareness raising, the assisting of cities who are pioneers. It is achievable, but we have to uh, get action. And faith-based organizations, as was said earlier, 80% of the world are part of one or other faith-based organization. They have a role to raise awareness uh, yes, to uh, push governments to do what's right, and at the local level, get engaged in some of the things that um, they do so wonderfully that prove you can uh, prevent rape, you can prevent uh, street violence. Thank you. I have can one I pitch in on the same, Michael? I mean, if, if you allow me. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear Irvin, and I think indeed, I mean, I would like to build on his argument. I think it's a very, very good and a very fair one. Uh, prevention is, is so much overlooked. It, it is uh, at the uh, core of, of the new, I mean, not new anymore. I mean, he will be uh, uh, perhaps in next year, I mean, confirmed in his second term as the UN Secretary General. But when he came in as the uh, new Secretary General, he definitely had prevention very, very, very high uh, on his agenda. And, and for exactly the same reasons as Urban is explaining, I mean, it's, it's just far more cost effective if you could prevent. It is, however, uh, not an AC task for a politician to explain to its constituency that you put money to prevent something to happen. I mean, take the pandemic. We all knew that this was preventable. We all had a forecasting that those things were to happen, but we didn't put in the resources in time because there are so many other priorities which we have around us. And another element which, which makes it more difficult is, um, yes, we need to curb the demands. I mean, uh, uh, but supply and demand, as we see in the drug business, they feed on each other. And, and uh, Michael, you've worked in the Caribbean. I mean, a lot of the problematics in the Caribbean was created by the sheer supply going to those poor islands, which created enormous demand, I mean, for criminality, for the drugs, for the addiction, you just name it and so forth and so on. Um, we need to do both. I mean, we need definitely to put a lot more emphasis on prevention, no doubt about it, fully agree with this uh, principle. Um, but we need as well to see how can we curb, I mean, the supply. I mean, we all go to the supermarkets and if you see a product for $5 standing there and you think it's of, of good quality, you buy it. How many of us have been standing still and said, yeah, but how was that T-shirt produced? I mean, at what part in Bangladesh has it been uh, uh, delivered or produced, subcontracted seven times so it becomes not visible, using child labor to make it as cheap as it is in our markets. I mean, it's very hard for a consumer to make that decision. There is though momentum happening at this moment, which perhaps as FBOs could be played upon. And it is the entire, it's half marketing, it's half branding, but there is definitely that discussion on social responsibility of the corporate sector. Is this something which we can do with regard to crime to bring that debate to wind it up, not only on environment, hard needed, child labor, hard needed, but as well on, on, on the issues which are of our concern. Is that something which we could engage in with, with, with the private sector to make sure that the supply as well gets somewhat reduced and better regulated? Over to you again. Okay, I think I have a last question. Uh, this comes from... Uh... Ambassador Coker's and Ms. Alvazi's and Mr. Tennant's statements that prompted the note that the first crime Congress, there was always been provisions for faith-based organizations where they could resort to when uh, if they were interested in crime prevention and criminal justice. Yet until now, that is the 14th crime Congress, not a single word would be directly relevant to the FBOs. And there were, but there were references to the civil society of general. So are we going backwards in some way? So I hear, I heard several people speak about past congresses and past uh, interactions. Uh, and now we seem to be moving back to a state, uh, a state club again. Uh, anyone want to take that one on? Uh, Anna. Yes, no, I think that uh, uh, there is uh, 
some consensus, uh, at least uh, within civil society, that uh, we are going backwards. Uh, we are going backwards. It's uh, as I said, we we have to be uh, to be careful not to to throw the baby with the <laughs> bathwater uh, because uh, we understand that, that there is a stress that there, there are difficult situations, but sometimes. Uh, really states uh, do things uh, um, in, in a disconnect uh, without uh, uh, realizing really the need to take a holistic approach. The, 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 the holistic approach promoted by the, the Agenda 2030, I think, was the, the magic of compromise. So it, 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 that, that could be taken as, a, as an example. And uh, and sometimes uh, states forget that they are the same who agreed to that uh, and uh, uh, things that we are talking about here, crime prevention and criminal justice is a big chunk, is a big part. We have the goal 16 that is a fundamental part of, uh, uh, of Agenda 2030. That is exactly our bread and butter. It is what we are doing. It is crime prevention and criminal justice. So uh, why can't we work uh, the same way uh, in, in a way that really allows everybody to own this agenda and uh, to identify uh, yourself in, in, in what uh, is, is a big mandate? It's not a piece of paper, otherwise we wouldn't be here discussing it. It's a very important uh, uh, mandate. It's, it's something that will accompany us for the for the next uh, few years until the next Congress. But I think that we would all like to be engaged in the preparation of the next, not a piece of paper, so that it really becomes more holistic and more inclusive. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have any other people wishing to speak now? Yes, uh, I will just add on uh, that uh, I think one uh, element is that um, FPUs as, 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 a, as a, an entity has been maybe submerged into civil society as a, as a broader framework. But uh, I must say that uh, compared to the previous years, previous decades, look at the range of activities and uh, 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 work done by civil society organizations, it has increased many times. But the point fundamentally is that like if one bad drop in a pond spoils the whole pond. So that is where the issue of uh, uh, about perception civil society in certain country societies, there's civil society organizations are being funded by the governments from other countries to create and lobby agenda, which is against the uh, host government's priorities and agendas. So that debate is also to be taken in a very candid manner that why certain NGOs have been uh, identified as working on behest of the foreign governments. That is the apprehension. I must, I'm sharing it with you very frankly, uh, how, what is the thinking in certain quarters? But overall, I think we must appreciate the civil society organizations, they have done tremendous work. They have supplemented the governments in certain areas. And uh, I, I think we must create a separate identity for FPUs apart from civil society. That is an effort which uh, uh, in, in the future processes, I think uh, we can uh, attempt to achieve that objective. Thank you. We look forward to working with you, Ambassador. I'll be back in Vienna soon enough. Anyone else want to make a final comment, please? Yeah, um, Michael, I just wanted to kind of on this um, on this point, uh, you know, about whether um, whether we're going backwards. Um, I think, you know, as you know, as I said in the main statement, I think that's pretty. Um, I think that's pretty clear. Um, and I think what's important to recognize as well is. You know, I used to be a state representative, um, and when I was in negotiations of the uh, CCPCJ, for example, as somebody who's never worked in a prison or as a criminal justice uh, practitioner, I found it invaluable to have in the room, which is allowed in the CCPCJ when negotiations are being done on resolutions in the Committee of the Whole, there are representatives of NGOs. So I would regularly go and speak to 
the Quakers or um, whoever else was there about what was um, what was going on, and I found it um, very useful. Um, but you can hear from uh, Ambassador uh, Koka's comments as well that there is, you know, this emerging tension and this uh, emerging suspicion of what civil society is trying to do. Um, and I would, but I, I would um, disagree with his solution that the 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 way to deal with it is to separate faith-based organisations from wider civil society. I I disagree. I think the the way to move forward is to look at civil society as a whole, as a diverse and multifaceted body of opinion and expertise that can help. You might not like all of them, uh, you might not agree with all of them, um, but what they do have and what the organisations that we have, for example, is a community um, perspective and real data, real expertise that states um, and it include especially those in closed meeting rooms in Vienna um, don't have, uh, and that's the that's the that's perspective, and that's the added value that we are trying to bring. I'm sorry, just to correct, I think you took me wrong. I, I did not say I just to have an identity because there was complaint, disappointment, FPUs are not being acknowledged in the document from that perspective. But as an overall okay. civil society, I said they are playing an important role. They are supplementing the governments in a lot of sectors fields. So please uh, don't take me. <laughs> okay, Thank understood. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? A final word? Jean-Luc, you want to have the last word? No? I, I wouldn't dare to have the last word. I mean, Michael, in any ways, but uh, <laughs> this is a civil society initiative, not the United Nations. One, uh, 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 let me just uh, uh, thank you all. I mean, for again, an interesting debate and, and, and thanking uh, uh, Tom and yourself, I mean, for, for uh, continuing to be a driver of, of this kind of opportunities to exchange views and uh, hopefully to make us all somewhat richer afterwards after hearing each other's uh, uh, points of view. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. I think we will be recording it and it will be available to those who want it. Thank you again. Thank you. Well, th thank you, uh, Michael and everyone. Just a few announcements. Uh, first of all, Ambassador uh, Hikihara uh, sends his uh, sincere apologies due to technical difficulties he had to pull away. We'll look to get the uh, copy of his remarks and have them posted. He's very appreciative and wishes us uh, all success of this webinar. And I think indeed uh, uh, it, it has been, and uh, our audience has stayed with us and we've all stayed together and found this stimulating. Uh, and we've each learned a lot. Just looking forward, a couple of important things that uh, we are preparing to propose a side meeting for the commission in May. And uh, in addition for the uh, UN, uh, uh, General Assembly special session on corruption. We've already submitted our proposals. So the coalition will uh, be active in May and June. Uh, at the coalition, uh, Michael and I, together with uh, members of our steering committee that includes Irvin Waller uh, of the coalition have produced a volume from all of the webinars we convened in 2020. And we have a 200 page volume of statements, uh, well written and crafted uh, on this topic of the role of faith based organizations. Uh, so, those of you that are at the commission, uh, Mike, if you see Michael Plotzer walking around with uh, books under his arm, you'll know uh, what that book is. But we're proud of it. And uh, it's only because of you. Many of you have been on previous programs. And uh, it's because of you that I think the coalition is uh, gaining uh, respect for the programs it convenes and the work that's being done. Uh, so I think we sign off with that. Uh, Michael, anything to add? No, we, we look for the continued alliance, particularly our friends from Pakistan and Japan and Italy and Spain. And so, adios from Fuerteventura. 
Thank you, everyone. All the best.